Uh, Let's turn to God's word, um, Numbers chapter 22. I'm going to read Numbers chapter 22, verses 1 to 20. This is part of a bigger section uh, about really two main characters, Balak and Balaam, uh, and a few others besides. uh, And that runs from chapter 22 through 23 and 24. So it's three chapters, big section. We're not going to read the whole thing now. When I preach, I will preach the passage, but also the the, the episode, the section as well. We'll, You'll you'll understand when we get there. But, But this is just 20 verses from Numbers chapter 22 so beginning at verse 1 the uh, Israelites have been kind of moving around with some success and some less success uh, falling out with the neighboring nations and then we're told verse 1 then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan opposite Jericho Now Balak son of Zippor saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, this horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor near the river Euphrates in his native land. Balak said, a people has come up out of Egypt, they cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land for I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will report back to you with the answer the Lord gives me. So the Moabite officials stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people that has come out of Egypt covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I will be able to fight them and drive them away. But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. The next morning Balaam got up and said to Balak's officials, go back to your own country for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. So the Moabite officials returned to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent other officials more numerous and more distinguished than the first. They came to Balaam and said, this is what Balak son of Zippor says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely and do whatever you say. Whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them, even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Now spend the night here so that I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night God came to Balaam and said, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. Let's turn back to Numbers 22. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, it is a privilege to meet as your people, to worship you and to hear the God of the universe speaking to us. Father, it's a privilege for us. It's a privilege for the children, whether they're in creche, whether they're in little Sunday school or big Sunday school, Father. And we do pray that you would speak to each one of us today. Father, you are our loving Heavenly Father and you have good words for us. So we pray, Father, that you would give us receptive hearts and minds to hear and respond to your word in whatever way you choose. We pray that all the glory would go to you. Amen. So, where's my clicker? I had a clicker. There it is. (laughs) Um, uh, This is uh, Beowulf. Uh, Beowulf, uh, you can probably hardly see that, but that's a script, right? There's words up there. And Beowulf is a massive 
epic poem. Right? It's like 3,000 words long. Right? I mean, for me, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Like, that's just where I'm at. But this is massive. 3,000 lines. Sorry, did I say words? 3,000 lines uh, of old English. Um, it's one of the most uh, translated, it's one of the most important works um, of Old English. It was possibly written in Rendlesham uh, here in Suffolk. Quite possible that that's where it was composed, where it was uh, written. Um, the, the story is set in pagan Scandinavia, you know, it's that kind of um, setting. Uh, and Beowulf is, is the hero. And there, I guess there's been films and probably computer games and all sorts made uh, about Beowulf. I had to study it at A-level and I confess I can't really remember anything about uh, Beowulf. Uh, apart from one thing, just one thing, and that's this, that back then for uh, kings, uh, as they were kings of tribes and, and people groups, um, kingly gift giving was a big deal. Right, the, just the whole process of a king uh, sitting at the table, and you know they'd, they'd be like a big battle, right? They've they've had a big battle, they've won a big fight, and then they have a big feast. You know the great halls, you've seen them on TV and stuff. You know big great halls, big feast round the table, and the king would obviously be at the top, the head, and all the rest of it. And and and, and at some point, the king would give gifts out to various people. It's very significant what they gave, who they gave it to. They'd give gifts to worthy warriors. Who'd, who'd fought well in battle. They might be giving gifts to sort of forge an alliance with somebody, but it was a very significant um, process for them. Kingly give, gift giving. Uh, and we're going to uh, take a look, uh, we'll think a little bit about those kings back then, but more so at our great king and at some of the kind of similarities and differences between those kings uh, and our great king Jesus. Let's get our bearings first. We're going to see two things in a moment, but let's just get uh, our bearings. Where are we? We've been in this book of uh, Numbers, haven't we? Essentially, God's people have messed up. Um, they've got it wrong. They, they, we saw sort of chapters 13 and 14. They've totally rebelled against God. They've treated God with utter contempt. They've forsaken his promises and they've really messed things up. Uh, and uh, so now they're in this bit where they're just in the wilderness wanderings. They're wandering around a little bit aimlessly. Uh, and that's going to be 40 years for them. Uh, but they are kind of going north. They're they're sort of heading upwards, and um, so sort of follow the yellow line, appreciate the green line of a bit of wandering and kind of going off piece and stuff like that, and that general movement up there towards, yeah, they're going sort of in the right direction, up into the land, towards the land that they're meant to be going into. Now, obviously, as they do that, big people group, they're travelling around, they're going around, and neighbouring nations and people groups are getting a little bit frightened, to put it mildly, right? They're scared, they're terrified, because it's massive nation of Israelites is moving around and uh, as they've gone around well they've avoided Edom so they've gone can we come through please no okay well we'll, we'll avoid Edom um, but they've uh, they've defeated the Amorites so they have won uh, in war so obviously people are a little bit scared of them uh, the Moabites as we dive into chapter 22 right here in this passage the Moabites are afraid and rightly so they're scared of the Israelites coming uh, to get them and so the Moabites don't they uh, uh, they make a well, they, they have a conversation with the elders of Midian. Uh, so Midian is down here, right? They're sort of tribal groups down here. Moab's kind of up there. They're talking to each other and they're saying, we've got this people group on our doorstep and we're pretty frightened. So they have that conversation with the Midianites. And then Balak, the king uh, of the Moabites, uh, this is it, right? This is this passage and this episode summed, boiled. This is what happens. Balak, simply Balak, king of Moab, wants Balaam, come to in a moment, wants Balaam to come and put a curse on God's people, right? So if you forget everything else, that's it. That's all it is. Balak, king of Moab, wants Balaam to come and put a curse on God's people. That's the, the passage we read and it's the whole episode. That's the, the nub of it really. Now, who's this Balaam? Well, Balaam's a bit of a weird character. He's sort of up here somewhere in the northeast, right? A bit like me, basically. Um, uh, he's an Aramean from up there somewhere, a bit of a sort of mysterious, magical 
sort of figure, uh, not quite sure, but he's up there. Uh, in 1967, um, a Dutch team uh, did an excavation, as, as people do in that part of the world, and they found this inscription, which is, it is another inscription that none of us can read, but it's an inscription nonetheless. So 1967, they dug this up in a place called Tel uh, Deir Allah in, cent- in the central Jordan Valley. Uh, and what they found here is an inscription. It's talking about different events but it names Balaam, son of Beor, a seer of the gods. So there's a, a text outside of the Bible, just referencing this guy as it talks about some different events. Balaam, son of Beor, uh, uh, son of Beor, a seer of the gods. And he's kind of from the northeast like me, and he's a bit weird. So um, that's Balaam. And all that's happening here is King, King of Moab, Balak, he's calling on Balaam, weird guy, to come and put a curse <laughs> on God's people. That, that's what's happening here. That's what he says, doesn't he? That's what he tells him to do repeatedly in the passage. Look, come and put a curse on these people. It comes up again and again and again. And God uh, says to Balaam, verse 12, do not go with them. So chapter 22, verse 12, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on them. Those on those people rather, because they are blessed. And then later on in chapter 23, uh, verse 20, uh, we, we, we come across, uh, we don't come across these words because they're not up there, but they are here. And I have received a command to bless. He has blessed and I cannot change it. That's Balaam, right? God has spoken to him and said, you're not going to curse these people because I've blessed them. Uh, and there Balaam just recognises that and he says, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed and I cannot change change it that really is the strap line of this whole section Uh, uh, he is blessed and i cannot change it and so what we're going to do is look at this under those two things he is blessed and i cannot change it okay and that's going to help us look at all of the chapters without uh, reading them all and going into all of the details he is blessed and i cannot change it god has blessed them hasn't he i mean we've seen this before but it's worth going there again because this is who our god is (laughs) Our God is a God who blesses, right? I mean, it just flows from his nature. Oh, let's not have a whole lecture on Trinitarian theology. But, but he's Father, Son and Holy Spirit, a community of love that has always existed in his relational and all of that. And so it is natural that when God creates, which is a blessing in itself, he then blesses his creation. He, he, what else can he do? He's a, a God, a great, good and gracious God, and he just blesses people, blesses the animals, and you see it, the sort of early chapters of Genesis, he blesses. Now, God does put a curse uh, on people, doesn't he, because of sin, Genesis chapter 3. So he does curse as well, but it is in his nature to bless. The curse is because of us, that's our fault, not his, but he, he does curse, but he blesses. God blesses uh, his people. Now, after that point, he still goes on blessing his people. All the way through the Old Testament, you see that. Uh, Genesis chapter 12, one of the most important passages in the Bible, isn't it? The promise is to Abraham, uh, and he says, I will bless. I will bless. You see God's absolute determination to bless Abraham and to bless He's people. God is a God who blesses. That's what he does. Uh, And that's Genesis, of course. And then we saw it again, didn't we? Chapter 6, actually. We saw, you might want to turn there if you've got a Bible open. Chapter 6, it was that thing where it's sort of familiar words. Uh, It was the song from the pandemic, wasn't it? The video that did the rounds. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. See, it's it's just, he, he, he wants to bless his people. Numbers chapter 6, he wants to bless his people. And, and it's a threefold blessing. The Lord bless you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord turn his face uh, towards you. Uh, and God, every day, look, every day the priest spoke these words over the people just to remind them that God is blessing them and he wants to bless them. And just towards the end uh, of the instructions about this blessing, he said, as the priests say these words over the people, uh, so they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. Remember, uh, we said, didn't we, when my kids were born, I went and and registered their names, and they've got first names, and they've got middle names, but I also put my name on them. Why did I put my name on them? Because they are my children. And that is glorious, isn't it? So he puts his name on his people every morning. 
Every morning the priests put God's name on them. The Lord bless you. The Lord, Lord, because they are his children. Because they're his people. And he loves them. And he blesses them uh, and cares for them. Uh, and that is absolutely glorious. Uh, but as we have seen in more recent times, actually they rebelled against God, didn't they? Chapter 13, chapter 4. And they treated God with utter contempt. But still he is determined to bless his people. That is incredible, isn't it? it is still, he is determined to bless wayward, wandering, weak, willful people. Why? Well, he gives the game away in, later on in the Bible story. Deuteronomy, Moses, Moses talking about what happened, past tense. The Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turn the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord God loves you. That's why God blesses his people. That's why no one can put a curse on God's people unless he allows them because he loves his people so much. Uh, he doesn't, uh, it's not uh, worthy warriors, is it? You think back to those kings, all right, you fought really well in battle, so now I'm going to give you a gift or I want to forge an alliance with you, so I'm going to give. It's not that, is it? It's not worthy warriors. It's unworthy failures that he chooses to bless rebellious children, people who've messed up and got it all wrong, marred by sin as we are, wandering hearts as we are, yet he chooses to bless us. I mean, is that the heart of the gospel? It's grace, isn't it? it giving to us what we don't deserve. It's Ephesians 1, isn't it? Every spiritual blessing has been given to us in Jesus. We didn't deserve that, but he poured it on us anyway because he loves us. So he has blessed you. Let me say to you this morning, do you know that for yourself? I'm not talking particularly this morning about material blessings. I think we could all say that God has blessed us materially, but spiritual. Do you know the spiritual blessings of Jesus for yourself? Look, I am loved. I am forgiven. I am adopted into the family. Is that something that you can say of yourself? That I've received the blessings of God. He is blessed. But then the second thing is, uh, with Balaam and I cannot change it. Remember that's what, what Balaam says uh, of this whole situation. God is blessed and I cannot change it. Um, uh, this is just like all, uh, like all the stories really, films and stuff that my kids love have got talking animals in them. Like, I just started thinking, and they've all... So the other day, I was just like, reading a random storybook to them, and I was like, oh, it's got talking animal here. Interesting. Um, but then when you think about all the films they love, literally all the films, like Ice Age, all that stuff, Paddington, and it's all talking animals, isn't it? I mean, it's all talking animals. Now, don't get me started on uh, the influence of the Bible in general on literature and stories and films and, and all the rest of it, right? Why is it that secular authors and filmmakers are still rolling around with the, the themes of the Bible, redemption and grace and forgiveness? They, they, even as they're rejecting it, they can't get away from it, right? They just can't, they just can't live without that stuff. It's so ingrained, it's so embedded. That's general. But the fun stuff is that uh, the Bible has also given us, as we'll see in a moment, this idea of talking animals. Fantastic. So all those films and many, many more besides stories, they're full of talking animals, aren't they? I mean, C.S. Lewis loved it as well. All the Narnians are talking animals. All of the, the, the talking animals, that's the, that's the big shock, isn't it? In the film, isn't it? He's, he's on the horse and he's telling the horse what to do and the horse turns around and goes, my name is Stephen. You know, and they, 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 that's just part of the, the, the fun and the story. So that's, that's Narnia and then obviously the classic is Shrek, isn't it? Donkey. <laughs> he's a talking donkey. Uh, and if that's where we are here. Now, I didn't read it, but it's the very next section. There is here a talking donkey. If you didn't know that about this Bible story, the very next thing that happens is we meet a talking donkey. God enables this donkey to speak, which is quite uh, amazing. But um, what happens? Well, Balaam gets on the donkey, right? Because God said, OK, well, you can go now. You can go. Right, he's been called to go and put a curse on God's people. God says, okay, well, you go. And so he goes and he gets on his donkey, doesn't he? He jumps on the donkey and basically, in a nutshell, what happens is the donkey just keeps veering off and going off paced and off course and Balaam's getting really cheesed off with his donkey. And he, the donkey even sort of pushes him into things and stuff. And the reason the donkey's doing that is because the angel of the Lord is here blocking his way. 
But Balaam doesn't know that. Balaam can't see that, right? So he doesn't know what's going on. He's just getting more and more hot-tempered and annoyed uh, with his donkey. Treats him quite badly. What's going on there? What, what's, I mean, what's all this about? We've gone from the big picture, like God's blessing and curses and all this, and then all of a sudden we're talking about a donkey, a talking donkey. What, what on earth is happening? At one point, the donkey turns around to him and starts talking to him. Says, what, like, what are you doing? Like, why are you whacking me? Uh, and, that, and that's what happens. But why, why, what is it all about? Well, partly, look, think about it from the donkey's perspective. The donkey is stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because the donkey's got the angel of the Lord in front of him and he's got Balaam whacking him and saying, like, why are you going off all over what you're doing, right? So he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. Now, that's a picture. It's a picture, isn't it? Because Balaam is also stuck between a rock and a hard place. He's got the king of Moab saying, put a curse on those people. And he's got the God of the universe saying, you will only say what I tell you to say. See, he's stuck between a rock and a hard place. The donkey pictures what's going on for Balaam. And then there's another aspect to that as well, isn't it? Uh, the, the, The donkey can see the angel of the Lord. The donkey's got like spiritual insight. He can see what's going on. And the donkey can talk. Now, Balaam is meant to be a seer, right? And he's like meant to be using words powerfully. He's meant to talk. That's the, and he's got to see and he's got to talk, right? That's, that's what Balaam's got to do. And the reality is that Balaam can't see what's really going on. And he can only say what God allows him to say. He's totally bound, isn't he? Totally bound. Totally under control. You know, the king of Moab, like three times, gets Balaam and goes, look, can you please put a curse on these people? And just what comes out of Balaam's mouth is not a curse, it's a blessing. Or it's just something else. He just, he can't do it. So he goes, all right, we'll move you. Let's put you over here. So let's try a different environment. Maybe that'll help somehow. And he does this three times. And every time, Balaam can't do it. He can't put a curse on God's people. He is totally bound. You get that in the passage. So chapter 23, verse 8, he just says, How can I curse those whom God has not cursed? How can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced? Uh, Verse 12, and this is a repeated idea that he says, Must I not speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? You see, God will bless. And I cannot change it. That's his experience. God will bless. And I cannot change it. He is sovereign. And so his blessing, his love, his grace is sovereign too. You see? He will do as he pleases because he is God Almighty and no Balaam is going to stop him and no Balaam is going to put a curse on his people. Think back to those ancient kings, you know, sort of marauding Vikings. You've all got pictures in your head, the horns and the axes and so on. And those kings, you know, and they'd, they would sit at the, the feast table and from that position of king, from sovereignty, from authority, from throne, they would give out these gifts to various people. Well, our God gives his gifts and his blessings from a throne of grace, from absolute sovereignty. He is the king of the universe. And he ain't trying to like forge alliances because he needs stuff. No, he just gives as he chooses to give freely. His sovereign will to bless. He is blessed and I cannot change it. And you know, nothing and no one can take away the blessing of God for us uh, as his people. Uh, We sing it all the time, but we sort of miss it, don't we? No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Uh, Or we sang it this morning. The soul that in Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavour to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Isn't that incredible? 
Let me read to you something that Balaam uh, says. He says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Implied answer, no. Does he promise and not fulfill? No, I have received a command to bless. He is blessed and I cannot change it. Uh, Balaam can't even put it into neutral, right? Now I can put it into neutral, yeah, okay, I know I'm a sort of soft-handed, cack-handed pastor, but I, I can put it into neutral, right? I can get in my car and I can do the wrong gear, put it into neutral. I guess you can as well. Can you put it into neutral? Yeah, some of you teenagers, are. you probably put it into neutral, can't you? You do that? Not yet, not allowed. <laughs> but, you know, you, you can put it into neutral. I can put it into neutral. Balaam cannot even put it into neutral. Right, because Balak says to him, he's getting a bit exasperated, and uh, chapter 23, verse 25, he says, all right, neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. Right, I want you to curse them. God said that you, they're going to be blessed. Can't you just bang it into neutral, right? It's not there, it's not here. Just put it into neutral, Balaam. Could you do that for me, please, Balak asks him. And Balaam can't. <laughs> he can't do it. He says, did I not tell you I must do whatever the Lord says? He can't even put it in neutral. Because God has chosen to bless. And it can't be changed. Now how? How? How can God irreversibly, irremovably bless me. How can God do that? How can God irreversibly, irrevocably, irremovably bless me? I deserve curse. Old Testament law, right? You keep it, blessings. You break it, curses. Well, let's have a look at the Old Testament law. I've broken the whole thing, right? And so have you. We've all broken the law at every point. And so, so I deserve the curses of God. That's where I'm at. I deserve the curses of God. I have broken all of his laws. I'm not covenant keeper. I'm a covenant breaker. How is it that God can irrevocably, irreversibly, irremovably bless me because someone bore the curse for me. That is the only way because someone on the cross bore the curse for me. Why is donkey still up there? <laughs> Don't know. That's it, isn't it? He took it for me. Like that, by rights is mine, I should be cursed. He took it for me on the cross. Look, this is the, youngsters, this is the heart of the Christian faith. It's really these two things. I, I deserve the curses of God. You will go on in life and you will realise that. Look, you've messed up in so many ways. You've got it all wrong. But Jesus died on the cross so that that curse could be taken on him in your place. And it's glorious. He took it for me. For. Isn't that word for amazing? He took it for me. I'm going to write a book. I've decided I'm going to write a book called For. Right? F-O-R. Imagine how this is going to go down with the publishers. I ring them up and say, Hello, my name is Richard Tell, and I want to write a book called For. And they say, look, like four reasons to, four, you know, four ways to make your life. No, no not F-O-U-R, F-O-R, four. I want to write a book called Four, and it's about God. Can you imagine? That's going to go down really well, isn't it? They're going to be like, oh, great, yeah, we're a bestseller. I want to write a book called Four, because it's one of the most amazing words in the world, isn't it? He did it for me. <laughs> he took it for me. It's incredible, tucked in in that verse. It's implicit, isn't it? In my place, on my behalf, in my place condemned he stood. He did it for me. 
So I'm going to write that book. <laughs> Probably not. You know, so, but for, he did it for me. On the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. He did it for me. Amazing love. We sing this all the time. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? For. One of the most amazing words in the world. He was born to bear the curse for me. To bring God's blessing to me. That is why he was born. That's why he came. Now Jesus is all over, as we close, Jesus is all over these chapters. He is everywhere. First of all, he's pictured here. We've already seen that, right? The curse and the blessing. All this stuff about curse and blessing all points forward to him. He took the curse and he brings God's blessing. You read about it, Galatians 3 and other places in the New Testament. Incredible. Jesus is pictured here. You know Jesus is present here as well in these chapters? Jesus is actually here in these chapters, right? What was the donkey's rock in our place? Remember, who's in front of him? The angel of the Lord. Now, the angel of the Lord is this strange Old Testament shadowy figure like, is this angel of the Lord God or, or is it not? It depends which passage you read. It's all a bit shadowy and mysterious and that's quite deliberate, I think. When you see the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament, it is, now I'm going to say too, it is Jesus. It's not Jesus because he isn't born yet, right? It's the pre-incarnate son, okay? He's eternal. He's always existed. It is the son of God popping up in the Old Testament. He does this from time to time. And then obviously, a thousand years later, he's born in Bethlehem. But the angel, Jesus is present here. He's pictured here, curses and blessings. He is present here. But it's more than that because he is promised here. Chapter 24, verse 17, all part of this section. Balaam's doing his talking, right? And he's not cursing God's people. He ain't allowed to do that. But words are coming out of his mouth. And he says, I see him, but not now. Oh, mysterious. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. Uh, a scepter will rise out of Israel. Now, I'll explain in a little moment why that is definitely about Jesus, right? But it is about Jesus. It's a promise of Jesus. It's a prediction of Jesus coming. So here in these chapters, Jesus is pictured. He's present and he's promised. He's predicted. And isn't it absolutely amazing? Isn't God astounding? Balak, king of... Look, this is just the simple thing, right? Remember, we remember this simple thing. that Balak, king of Moab, wants to get Balaam to put a curse on God's people with me yeah remember that bit very simple that's just the geography of it isn't it Balak what wants Balaam to put a curse on God's people and all Balaam can do is prophesy about the one who will come and take the curse from God's people that is all he can do so he's have a go, I'll try and curse these people. I mean, he knows he can't because God said, you're only going to say what I say. But he has a go a few times, doesn't he? And when it comes to this one, he tries to curse God's people. Balak wants him to do that. He's paying him a bit of money to do it. And all he can do is prophesy about the one who will come and take the curse from God's people. Isn't our God amazing? Isn't he astounding that, that he can do that? That he can take the intent of curse against people, he can take that and he can turn it into a promise of the one who will come and bear the curse for you, for me. That is incredible. Amazing. What an amazing God we serve. Okay, I said I'd explain how it's Jesus. Okay. Okay. A star will come out of Jacob. Jesus is the bright morning star, Revelation 22, Luke chapter 1. A scepter, that's a kingly thing, isn't it? Yes, it's a promise of King David, but ultimately it's a promise pointing forward to the greater Davidic king, Jesus. Now, what's our king like? What's our king like? He is not a king who gives his gifts to the best and the brightest and the biggest and the baddest and the boastfulest or whatever, to the, to the worthy warriors. 
He's not a king who gives his blessing to worthy warriors. No, he gives his blessing to unworthy people like you and me. That's what our king is like, the great king of kings. Do you know that for yourself today? Uh, Jesus uh, brought, didn't he? He's the blessing of the king of kings. And it was brought to you at a great price. Do you know that for yourself personally? And I guess most of us in this room do. What a comfort. What a confidence. What a courage building thing it is that he has blessed. And nothing and no one, Balaam, anything can change that. Let's pray. Father, you have blessed us in your Son and your blessing is sovereign and you sit on a throne over all creation and we are entirely secure in your love, in your grace and in your blessing. Father, help us to see it Help us to know it. Help us to feel it. And would you give us great confidence for the days ahead. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.